Do you know it was nearly 20 years ago that the album The Button Down Mind of Bob Newhart was released. And to this day, many of us who remember chuckling along with it can almost completely recite the driving instructor. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow that is in itself an enormous tribute to Bob Newhart. To tap into the American public's mind and imagination and humor and have it remain, and then of course build on it, for all these years is a wonderful thing. Well, thank you. Thank God. I was talking earlier about, we were talking about the, making the first album, and uh, it was made in Houston, uh, at the Tidelands, and we made it in February of 1960, and it was released April 1st, 1960. And uh, I was in Chicago at the time, I was playing Mr. Kelly's, and um, contacted Warner Brothers Records saying, you know, I'd like to get some copies of the album because, you know, some of my friends said they'd, they'd like to buy it, you know. They said, well, it's gone crazy in Minneapolis. They said they're playing it all the time, and every record we're pressing, we're sending to Minneapolis. And uh, Howard Viking broke it. Um, and it was a very nice feeling. It was, uh, so I always associate uh, Minneapolis with, with me. It's always, you know, I, I can't separate the two. That's the first place the, the record took off. So. Isn't that nice to hear? Now, of course, that's when the public became aware of Bob Newhart, working very hard in Mr. Kelly's and other places to become yeah. known. But Bob Newhart existed before that. Wh what, where did you come from? What was your background? Well, you know, you know, accounting, I was an accountant for two years. Um, left that, went into advertising for six months. Um, I worked for a guy who fired half of the room. You know, if, if things weren't going well, this side of the room was fired, and I happened to be on the wrong side that day, so I was out of a job after six months. Uh, another guy and I went into, uh, did a radio program, uh, which was seen in three cities, uh, Idaho Falls, Idaho, uh, Jacksonville, Florida, and Northampton, Massachusetts. And, uh, we received a grand total of $22.50 a week, it cost us a grand total of forty dollars a week to do the program, tape and postage and things like that. Uh, okay. We were stiffed by one station, wouldn't didn't pay us, which then went down. Let's see, twenty-two fifty a week. That would be fifteen fifteen dollars a week. The two stations wanted to pick us up, and we wrote them back and told them we we couldn't afford to do the program anymore. It was costing us costing us too much money. But out of that program. Um, came a lot of the record routines. The, the Submarine Commander originally was done on radio. Um, the Retirement Party originally was done on radio, so. Yours is... Inter and interestingly, you mentioned the driving instructor. I didn't drive at that time. At the time I wrote the driving instructor, I didn't drive. But it was a result of uh, being out of work. And I would look in the, in the Chicago Tribune every Sunday in the one ads, and they always had uh, driving instructors. I guess they called it a standing ad or something like that. It, it ran every week. It was always a big ad. Um, you know, driving instructors needed. And uh, seeing this every week, I, it occurred to me there must be a huge turnover in driving instructors. <laughs> and then I began to imagine possibly why there was a huge turnover, and the reason being that it's very dangerous work, you know. That they, they, can only, they can only take it for a certain number of weeks, and then finally they had to get out of it. And that, that really was the basis for the... Uh, for the driving instructor. Your humor uh, is so unique. Um, we're used to stand-up comedians who tell one joke after another. You tapped a whole different vein. And yet all stand-up comedy, it seems to me, and I've certainly never done it, would be a terribly vulnerable position to be in. Perhaps the most of all in show business because ultimately if they don't laugh it is the supreme rejection and you are all alone. <laughs> You have a great deal of insight, that's true. <laughs> it is, uh, well, if you can't sing, you know, you got to do something. Uh, no, a singer can hide behind uh, a bad arrangement or um, can update his act, take out his Cole Porter medley and put in his uh, um, Sammy Fain medley or whatever, Irving Berlin medley. Um, a comedian, you're really standing out there and saying, I think this is funny, and, and when it isn't, it, it's your own personal you're naked. I mean, you're out there all by yourself, and uh, but I, that's part of the kick of it, I guess. I, that's part of the, the joy is when you're when you're right more often than you're wrong. So you've already established. I couldn't imagine doing anything else. I mean, I couldn't imagine anything being as much fun as being a comedian. It's uh, 
and to, make, to be able to make people laugh is it's a it's a wonderful thing. It's a nice feeling. So we can guess from that that you like taking risks because that's a risk. You write it and you present it. I guess how uh, then does doing a television series, which you were so very successful with, jive? Because in fact, there you're met with a bevy of writers, directors, camera work, bouncing off of other people. It's a completely different element and one which you may not have had ultimate control over. You're right. I shouldn't have done it. <laughs> 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 but it certainly had to have been a very new challenge. No, you're right. For you're you. right. There was that. But you see, I did a show. Uh, I did a variety show in 1960, where uh, 1961, uh, we got a an Emmy Award, a George Peabody Award, and a Pink Slip from NBC, all in the same year. As a matter of fact, that year at the, at the Emmy Awards, every show that got an Emmy had been canceled. How is that possible? <laughs> that happens. Dick Van Dyke. That was the year Dick got their show got a, an award. Um, I don't know. I don't know. But I did that show, and in that show, I tried to do everything. I tried to, I tried to write it. I tried to direct it. I tried to cast it. So when this show came along, I said, these are good people. Uh, they're talented people. They know what they're doing. I'm going to do, I'm going to make certain creative inputs, but I'm not going to intrude on other people's uh, areas. I mean, they're good at what they do, and you have to trust them. That's the secret of any success in anything. You get good people and trust them. And, and just let them do what they do, what they do well. Even a step beyond that then, because certainly you still were involved in a more controlled situation with television, is films, which you've been involved in all along. And now, of course, with the first family, you have the lead as the president of the United States. <laughs> um, film is really a difficult medium for someone who wants to have control, because finally, after you do that shot, you have no idea what the director and the editor will ultimately do with it. That's true. The, the hardest part of, of doing film is that uh, you don't know if what you've done is any good until nine months later. In some respects, it's similar to other, other things. Um, that's the hardest part I found, because I'm so used to the immediate reaction. Uh, either it's funny or it's not funny, but I know it at that moment. In this case, you do it, you think it's funny, but ultimately, the public is going to tell you whether it's funny or not nine months from when you did it. I mean, it's, it's that distance. In, in film, you have a great deal of time, which is good. You don't always have that doing a television series. Um, we did ours in four days, and boom, 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 and, and it's out. Uh, in film, you can try a lot of different things. Uh, it's kind of nice. It's a relaxing, uh, less pressured kind of existence. You don't have to remind people anymore who Bob Newhart is. We know you. Your audience is established. You're d as a matter of fact, coming in uh, to the hotel, I had to remind someone. You did? Yeah. I was walking Must up be the, very, very I difficult. I tugged him on the thing. Yeah. You, know, you know I'm you, Bob you've Newhart. You've met me. Would He's, you like my autograph? I said, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything that you... How did you, you break your nose? You noticed no, that. Similar, I know, I know. I'll Mine tell you. takes a different... I know I have a very, what he's talking about is my very crooked nose, which <laughs> I had never wanted any of you to know about, but he blew it. Um, uh, what do you want to do that you haven't done? Um, go home. <laughs> Be left alone. <laughs> don't bother. No, I don't know. The, the only area I haven't worked in uh, would be Broadway, but I'm not sure. I mean, there's a part of me that wants to do it because it's the one area I haven't worked in. Uh, I don't know if I would enjoy it or hate it or whatever. It's a discipline I've never had to deal with every night doing the same, the same thing. But I have four children, and it's very difficult to just pull up stakes and move to New York for a year. Um, I suppose that's the one thing I haven't done that I'd, I'd like, to, like to try. We wish you all good things. Thank you. It's just very nice to kind of sit and chat. And I'm glad Minneapolis loved you almost <laughs> first. Thank you, Minneapolis. Bob Newhart, starring in The First Family. And we'll be right back. Oh, <laughs> do you know how my nose got broken? Why won't you take five? Okay. Right. Well, my you mother took a pair of tennis shoes at me oh, when I was yeah. a kid. Oh, she didn't need them. She was just apoplectic when it happened. It was one of those I said, Mother, I need these. And she said, oh, well, here. And she threw them. That's good.